it's very important and there are many stemi equivalents are there and uh, i just briefly will touch on because it, it will not be uh, time bound manner we cannot cover everything as i told you wellens the great wellens who, who has uh, left us last uh, week he has described wellens syndrome type a and type b one is a biphasic st segment depression like Biphasic, it is positive than negative. Another Wellens syndrome is uniform. It's it's a deep symmetrical T wave inversion. So Wellens syndrome is considered as an anti-Wallemi equivalent. What is that? If you are not going to uh, pick this pattern, this patient is going to have a complete transmural occlusion in a period of one week. So this patient is giving you a grace period of one week time. So please don't pass off T inversion in V1 to V3 as a persistent juvenile refractory uh, persistent juvenile T inversion pattern as we used to do before. Right, and there's another pattern called sharp T wave pattern, where there's a J point depression with which is uh, which resulting or which is joining with a convex ST segment. Uh, so this is a sharp T wave pattern. And D winter sign also I will show you all the ECG pattern. There is going to be a J point depression with a hyperacute tall T wave. Again, D winters described this is in 2008. Again, an anterior wall MA equivalent. Okay, so all this is a very classical STEMI equivalence. We should not miss all those things. And sometimes new onset left frontal branch block also can present as anterior wall MA. So I will show you all the Scarborough criteria. And it is very difficult at times to differentiate left ventricular hypertrophy with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So I will also show you an hyperacute T wave is the initial manifestation in some of the patients with anterior wall MA. So what is the most important thing in just remember three criteria for left ventral branch block presenting a STEMI. So, so the most important thing is concordant ST segment elevation. What is concordant ST segment elevation? If the this if if suppose the QRS is up, the ST the ST segment the or the T wave is always uh, uh, inverted in patients with LBVV. Whereas if concordant means if it is upright QRS. Wave, then the ST segment should also be elevated. That is concordant ST segment elevation. That if it is more than even if it is more than one mm, that is sufficient. Whereas disconcordance is commonly seen in LBVV. But to 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 merit a ischemia point, the there should be excessive disconcordance. That it should be the ST segment elevation should be more than five millimeters. And more important, other thing is what is called uh, Cabrera notch. So in the ascending limb of the S wave, there is a notch in the ascending limb. That is one of the soft signs for ischemia. And if you have to see the divide, ST segment, the height of ST segment elevation. Divided by the height of S wave, if it is more than 25 percentage, then that is one of the criteria. So, so you come here, just see this patient, and this is one more criteria. So, in a this is left bundle branch block. Why do you say left bundle branch block? Because monophasic R in one AVL and negative uh, QRS in B1, and also monophasic R or in V5, V6. But what happens in B2 to B3 if there is going to be ST segment depression? So, if in the anterior leads V1 to V3, there is going to be ST ST segment depression, then. Uh, it is very significant. It suggests there is a uh, new onset ischemia. So very important. Also, one other so soft sign is if you see in V3, V4, V5, V6. Normally in V5, V6, the QRS is upright. But in a patient with non-ischemic LBVB, the T inversion should be there. But what happens here? The T wave is upright. So an upright T wave in V5, V6 in patient with LBVB suggests it's an ischemia, and you should be very careful, right? So, so you can see here the the uh, the above ECG strip is nothing but a non-ischemic LBV, where you can see the V5 V6. So the ST segments or the T waves are inverted. ST segment depression is there, whereas here there is going to be a concordant ST segment elevation with the upright T wave, which the, the the bottom strip. So very classical. And what happens this? This I have already told you. 51 year old male, vague chest pain. Sometimes the patient may present with a dynamic vague chest pain, top T to negative. But if you can see V1 to V3, there is classical. I can say this is a biphasic. There is slight upright of a T, uh, T wave and there is T wave inversion. So this is somewhat can call as a biphasic T wave inversion. But when taken in another point of time, so it may disappear also. This is I told you this Wellens syndrome, and you can see there is a proximal LED after the diagonal branch is critically diseased. 90, 95, 90 to 95 percent stenosis is after stenting. So the most important thing in Wellens syndrome is if during pain. If you take the ECG, the ECG may be normal. The T inversions may disappear. Whereas if the patient is not having pain, if you take ECG at that time, there will be T inversion. So this dynamic change in T wave inversion, along with the uh, symptoms of ischemia, uh, so you have to be very careful because echo may be normal in this patient and drop A may be negative in this patient. So very careful. We have to be very very significant. And these are the ECGs very classically shown. So one is the deep T wave inversion here, and another is a biphasic pattern here. So in the so in the patient. The patient during chest pain, there is no T wave inversion. 
And when the patient is having no chest pain, the TV inversion cells, the dynamic TV inversions are very important. And D. Winters has described this. When there is going to be a J-point depression with upsloping ST segment elevation, uh, upsloping ST segment depression, but if it is going to be more than one mm, and there is going to be hyperacute or rocket type rocket like uh, T wave, then there is D wave D winter sign again. This is very classical of LAD occlusion. So and this patient has to be treated again. So again, you can see this is the ECG. You can see sometimes it may not be seen in B1. It is seen in B2 to B3. You can see J-point or ST segment depression. Sloping ST segment depression with a hyperacute all T wave, so very classical. And in this patient, the proximal LED, you can see here, sorry, the arrow mark was wrong. Here, the LED is up to, uh, the, there is 90% stenosis here. So, very important. So, this, this is one of the very classical. Sometimes the ECG changes may be normal at initial presentation, but we have to, when you have to take serial ECGs, the changes may evolve uh, uh, sequentially. So, this is a patient presenting with chest pain of 15 minutes. So, you come to the hospital, we can see there is very insignificant ST segment depression in 3 and AVF, right? If you see after some time, you can see the T waves in the anteriors, V2 to V3, they become that they are, they are trying to become taller. They're trying to project themselves. Whereas if you see here, now the changes have become more prominent, right? You see B2, B3, there is some ST segment depression and there is a hyperacute T wave. Also, if you see the inferior leads, there is going to be a good ST segment depression. So what I'm trying to say here is sometimes the reciprocal changes will come first before the, you know, the primary change. Also, initially the changes at the first ECG may look normal and you cannot dispose the patient as having a non-cardiac chest pain at this ECG. Okay, your ECG is not significant, you can go home. No, always take at least four ECGs in a period of at least over, spread over a period of six hours. And if it is going to be, uh, if it is going to be completely normal and aided by other biomarkers and echo, then only out to discharge. Otherwise, please be prudent because we have missed some of the very important patients like that. Uh, the, some of the patients, some of some one of the ex MLAs have been labeled as uh, normal ECG. So he, he went up, uh, he has to travel uphill. While traveling uphill, he had a severe recurrence of angina and uh, he had uh, sustained a cardiac arrest. So, uh, so, so by a by election was conducted for that. This was the history. So, what I'm trying to say that so in patients uh, with acute coronary syndrome, our patient is present in chest pain. So you have to take serial ECGs. That is one of the very, very important things. So this is all I have told you. And this is the patient. You can see that patient. If you are going to ask the patient to go to the home, he is going to go to home and have an anterior wall MA. So this is somewhat flowing. 99% stenosis, but there is going to be a TME2 flow is there. And this is after successful angioplasty. So it is very, very difficult sometimes. CKD patients can present with the STEMI because they have already have left ventricular hypertrophy. So now how to differentiate left ventricular hypertrophy from STEMI? It's, it's, it's very difficult. So what are some criteria are there? Suppose if there is going to be ST segment elevation in more than three leads, it points STEMI, right? Also like LBBB, if the height of ST segment elevation by S wave, if it is going to be more than 25%, then again, it suggests ischemia. And there is one, one phenomena called overshoot phenomena. If, if it is going to be a symmetrical T wave inversion, then it is ischemia. If there's going to be asymmetrical, that is T waves are inverted, but it's overshooting above the baseline, then it is left ventricular hypertrophy, right? So these are, and T wave inversions also suggest if, if we want to V3 in a patient with LVH, there is going to be T wave inversion, then it is a STEMI. So, but it is sometimes we may miss it. Some uh, uh, sometimes it is very difficult to differentiate. And coming on to the AVR lead. So in ECG, AVR is called the orphan lead because there is no company. There is no contiguity for AVR lead because for V1 there is V2 to V4 they have relatives for inferior leads two three AVR for relatives. Whereas AVR is an orphan lead, but AVR lead is oftentimes it is a very important lead because it it implies osteal LAD or LMC occlusion. The ST segment elevation in AVR can be seen in triple cell disease also. Uh, ST segment elevation in AVR can be seen in proximal RC occlusion also. So coming on to non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome, we know that ST segment depression or T wave inversion is going to be there. So ST segment depression is divided into an upsloping ST segment depression, horizontal ST segment depression and downsloping. So we know that upsloping ST segment depression is not that dangerous when compared to a horizontal or a downsloping ST segment depression, right? An upsloping ST segment depression after 80 milliseconds J point is, is and more than 1.5 mm or more than 2 mm is significant. Otherwise it is not that uh, dangerous. Okay. So, okay. 
sometimes this patient is non st uh, non st elevation acute conditions no may present normally the the ecgs may not show anything but their angina may be very significant so uh, this is because of this phenomena the latest definition for ecg uh, have come up with biomarkers also so in addition to ecg you have to corroborate with other uh, echo or you have to corroborate with biomarkers also now biomarkers are available in almost all the centers so please before labeling the patient as uh, having a normal ecg Uh, or non cardiac chest pain we have to corroborate with everything so this, for example this patient if you see this ecg is completely normal you can see here but what, what happened here l6 is showing critical stenosis what happens to lad lad again showing 90% stenosis so pda is again so it's a critical so it is a very tight triple vessel disease i can say but what this example is to show you that patient with chest pain should not be ignored based on a normal ecg alone sometimes the biomarkers can also be negative that is what we call it as unstable angina so so the patient can have critical block cells were also in presence of even normal ecgs please do subject them to other forms of modality right so troponin has become very important so with high sensitivity troponin the sensitivity is higher but specificity may not be that good just i will skip all the slides because this is not mainly on ecgs okay This is another patient who brought to was brought to the ER with the history of resuscitated cardiac arrest outside, resuscitated by bystander CPR and ECG. This is ECG after six. So very careful if you see the QRS are wider. So this 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 alone history of cardiac arrest followed by a wider QRS alone is suggestive of a very ominous ECG. I could confirm. Now you can see AVR again. There is going to be ST segment elevation in AVR. and there is going to be st segment depression in most all of the leads this the, what does this imply this implies is either a left main occlusion or a triple vessel disease and if you can see the angio this is only the left main stump is there so it should give rise to one lad it should give rise to one l6 but it is occluded so it's a proximal or mid lmc occlusion this is after stenting so so this is a very very important so uh, this is another patient chest pain pulmonary edema and cardiogenic shock again if you see There is ST segment depression is there in almost all the leads. One AVL, B5, B6, two, three AVF. But if you see AVR, so if you have a diffuse ST segment depression in all the leads, except in AVR where there may be ST elevation, we have to think of LMCA or or triple vessel disease. And you can see it's very classical. This left main mid shaft left main is critical is critical seventy to eighty percent stenosis. L6 stenosis is there. LAD is disease. So. This is this this is the pattern mode, which is called LMC pattern or TVD pattern. Post PCA, you can see the ECG is uh, as, as quite normalized. Uh, so again, again there is diffuse ST segment depression everywhere. Two, three AVF, V5, V6, but ST segment elevation AVF. You can see this is the left main very very critical disease, and this patient underwent CABG. After CABG, the changes resolved completely. Right. Another patient there is a diffuse ST segment depression and ST segment elevation AVF. and again you can see the nasty presentation the distal lmc is completely occluded whereas the lmc is completely thrombosed and stenosed and l6 also diseased and this patient underwent successful uh, stenting and this is after successful lmc to lad and lmc to l6 stenting so again i told you in ckd patients sometimes it is very difficult ckd patients hypertensive patients presenting with chest pain it may be non cardiac or cardiac but it is very times it is very very difficult to uh, diagnose Which which of them have? So what are the criteria? Just three four criteria I will say you. If there is going to be a symmetrical T wave inversion, then it more often suggests ischemia. The the phenomenon of overshoot. What is overshoot? Is I will just show you. So if you can see, you can see here there is a T wave inversion is here, but the ascending limb of the T wave it is going to cross this this is the T P segment. So if if it is going to cross the baseline, I would. goes above that baseline that is called a t wave overshoot and here what is called t wave overshoot is there and this t wave inversion is not symmetrical you can see the descending limb is shorter than the ascent so when you have an asymmetrical t wave inversion and when you have a overshoot then it means that it is lvh whereas in patients with ischemia there will be a symmetrical t wave inversion and there will not be any overshoot okay so so I I think I have got some time. I will just briefly go through arrhythmias in acute coronary syndrome. It's very important when you are evaluating a patient with ECG with acute coronary syndrome. You some of the arrhythmias you should be very familiar because it's not the ischemia; it is the arrhythmia that is going to kill the patient. So this is the common arrhythmia in the patient in a patient with inferior volume. You can see there is going to be diffuse ST segment elevation everywhere. Two sorry in the inferior leads two three AVF, whereas three and two are almost equal. But if you can see AVL ST segment depression is more than 
lead one st segment depression it means it is an rca uh, occlusion is there also if you can see in b1 there is going to be st segment depression here it means that it is an acute interior plus posterior wall mi right also what is the rhythm why there is going to be bradycardia that's going to be complete or block there is no clear cut pqrs relationship and there is diffuse bradycardia so p and qrs are not related to each other so complete or block is one of the common arrhythmia seen in patients with acute inferior wall mi and we all know that uh, so what is polymorphic vt polymorphic vt when the qrs morphology is changing and the axis and the axis is changing then we call it as polymorphic vt so polymorphic vt in a patient with chest pain always indicates an acute ischemia a scar vt so monomorphic scar vt what is monomorphic the qrs are regular their axis is regular their morphology is regular so when you have a monomorphic vt in a patient uh, with a history of cad it means that this patient already had history of uh, old mi somewhere in the recent past maybe one year back maybe two year back maybe 20 years back but more often monomorphic vt doesn't occur in the setting of an acute coronary syndrome it occurs because of a scar and a reentry phenomena that means that the mi has occurred in the remote past so whereas polymorphic vt when there is you can see very clearly here the qrs morphology is upper sort it is changing like anything so when you have a poly what is polymorphic different morphology when you have this then you ought to always suspect acute coronary ischemia and you should have a lower threshold to treat this arrhythmia and uh, you should just uh, cardiovert them and take the patient to cath lab and treat aggressively the patient so another patient very classical this is taken from the circulation article you can see you can see if the v1 v2 there is going to be some st segment elevation is there in v1 uh, immediately what happens there is a vpc coming on and this vpc is falling on the t wave and when there is myocardium is at ischemic uh, pre when the myocardium is completely ischemic and when a depolarization event come or tries to fall into the repolarization zone then this is a very classical vf or uh, polymorphic vt is triggered here and what happens here this patient has gone into ventricular fibrillation so the, the extreme last slide shows ventricular fibrillation whereas other shows showing rnt phenomena initiating a polymorphic vt so very very dangerous this is actually this is one of the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in patients with anterior wall mi or even for that matter even in fear acute stemi so what happens here this again another patient acute inferior wall mi you can see 2 3 avf or a, a acute or subacute maybe 2 3 days duration but what happens here you can see in b1 there is one lbv pattern one rbv pattern so the qrs morphology is alternating but it is regular there is some uh, regularity is there so this is called a bidirectional ventricular tachycardia so when there is a lbvv and rbvv that is v1 showing negative qrs then a positive qrs so when a vt is happening and we have an alternating lbvv and rbvv and it suggests that it's the bidirectional vt and again bidirectional vt predominantly occurs in the form of acute ischemia so polymorphic vt and bidirectional vt predominantly occurs in the setting of acute ischemia whereas monomorphic vt usually occurs in the setting of an old mi so very very important this is what vt in the setting of old anterior wall i have told you very clearly this see all the if you see v1 all are upright regular if you can see uh, all the other if you see v4 also all upright regular so so this monomorphic vt suggests it's a scar vt okay so what is this rhythm so we all know that what is this uh, so this is what is this patient this patient is again having a qr vv mi v12 v3 v4 so this is an acute anterior wall mi so suddenly what happening is here you can see this is the sinus rhythm you see the l2 rhythm strip this p wave qrs right p wave qrs this qrs is normal suddenly what happens so white qrs emerges and the pqrs relationship is lost so this nothing but an idioventricular rhythm right idioventricular rhythm uh, need not always uh, rhythm or uh, represents the successful recanalization okay so whenever a idioventricular rhythm happens there is going to be the isorhythmic av dissociation more often the p wave is going to hide inside the qrs so it's a very classical the patient is having a sinus rhythm here then idioventricular march of idioventricular rhythm complexes then again sinus rhythm then again idioventricular rhythm complexes so the very very classical all this rhythm disturbances you have to be very interested and you have to start analyzing all these things just by diagnosing and treating acute coronary syndrome you should not be very happy just you have to uh, dig more deeply into the ecgs and i already told you these are the stemi mimics we have told you and and uh, coming on to stemi mimics sometimes non cardiac conditions can present as stemi like i told you covid myocarditis is one example the other other patterns like a normal left ventricular branch block or an acute pericarditis hyperkalemia hypercalcemia sometimes very commonly early repolarization syndromes all these things can 
present as STEMI, and sometimes patients have been thrombolyzed for non-cardiac conditions, right? Especially Brugada syndrome patients. Brugada syndrome, you know, the dusty going is going to be there, and V1, V2, V3, and very important. It's very easy to differentiate an acute pericarditis from uh, other forms of uh, ischemia because there is going to be ST segment elevation in almost all the leads except in AVR and V1, where there is going to be ST segment depression. And in all the leads, there is going to be a PR segment depression. Whereas in AVR and V1, there is going to be PR segment elevation. If it is going to be there, then it is going to be acute pericarditis. And more often, this patient have, will have pericardial rub. And what, why it is so important is that patient of Andrew LMA, subjected to a triple SLD, subjected to CABG, in the post-op, they may call you saying that this patient has a fresh ST segment elevation, right? So you have to very carefully ascultate. You have to do a, a echo and please don't uh, again thrombolize this patient. So this is just you have to you have to be very good at differentiating an acute pericarditis from an acute ischemic pattern. So because in that post-op setting, ST segment elevation post CABG can happen due to two reasons. One is due to pericarditis. Another thing due to graft occlusion because the treatment is going to be hell and heaven difference between these two conditions. You should be adept. You should be very confident in differentiating between the two diagnoses. And 58 year old female uh, having frequent missed beats, giddiness, epigastric pain and vomiting and, uh, and, and the patient is on digoxin for valvular heart disease. So what is the rhythm going on? You can see it's a junctional. So you can see there is going to be a good amount of ST segment depression, right? A reverse tick sign and there is an overshoot of the T wave. This is very classical of digitalis uh, rhythm. So if you have a ST segment depression which is a reverse tick sign and there is going to be a T wave overshoot this is called digitalis effect. But what is digitalis toxicity when there is going to be arrhythmias like AV blocks or, or automatic increased uh, ectopic related junctional tachycardias. So you call it as digitoxicity, right? So this patient has a features of toxicity. This was the baseline ECG of this patient. And this is after correcting potassium and stopping with oxygen this patient. So, so sometimes patient may present with chest pain, breathlessness with this ECG. Uh, what I'm trying to say that this patient should not be treated as post MA or this patient should not be treated as non ST elevation MA, right? Should not give FN all those things. Just uh, try to illustrate the drug history, try to illustrate the other history, especially digoxin, try to uh, seek for electrolyte imbalances. All those things are very, very important. This is another patient, 15 year old uh, female patient with severe chest pain. So tachycardia is there, tachypnea is there, desaturation is there. What is ECG showing? ECG is showing non-specific ST segment depression in, in uh, B, B2, B3, all these things, right? So tropa is also positive. So it's so very important. Tropa can be positive in a lot of conditions. Like it can be positive in myocarditis. It can be positive in pericarditis. It can be positive in CKD. It can be positive in volume overload. It can be positive in cardiac contusions. It can be positive in pneumothorax. It can be positive in, uh, in severe systemic sepsis also positive or in state uh, multi organ dysfunction can be positive. Just by looking up ST segment depression, just by picking up a positive property, don't treat the patient with thorax and CT showed a ruptured bullet. So if you're going to give heparin antiplatelets in this patient, it is going to worsen the situation. So please have a, a quick clinical examination. Uh, if, if the entry is not good, then you have to suspect uh, uh, this uh, like pulmonary conditions also. In So what happens this patient, 40 year old male patient with chest pain, shortness of breath and status epilepticus, right? So this is the ECG and there's severe tachypnea is there, 40, respiratory rate is 40. And you see the saturation is 80% right? and the patient is in hypotension. And you are almost arrested on the door of our emergency. So what is the diagnosis here? It's a very classical pattern. You can see sinus tachycardia is going on and the background of tachycardia, tachypnea. And there is also status epilepticus. Okay, and if you can see S1, so lead one is showing S1. And if you see in lead three, there is Q wave is there and T wave inversion is there. So S1, Q3, T3 pattern, along with sinus tachycardia, along with evidence of RV strain. If you see in the V1, R by S ratio is more than one. Normally in V1, R, R by should be shorter. If the R by S ratio in V1 is taller, then one of the indications is RV strain along with ST segment depression and T wave inversion. So from this itself, you should diagnose this is a case of acute massive PT. And this patient did not give us time to ship for CT pulmonary angiogram because he arrested. So CPR started and this patient was given thrombolysis. Okay, just a quick screening echocardiogram showed RARB dilated and, and we started immediately and this, this, this is done after thrombolysis and this patient is coming to regular follow-up but two years follow-up. So, so this is very important. We should all uh, emergency physicians and all MD physicians 
you should know how to do a basic echocardiogram to look for lv function and this this echocardiogram is classically showed a dilated rar so if you have sinus tachycardia desaturation hypoxemia hypotension with a dilated rar in any setting post operative state or chronic illness patient or any chronic hospitalized patient elderly patient with or without dvt you have to suspect pulmonary thromboembolism it is not always important to have a uh, dvt right this other elderly lady frail lady presenting with uh, chest pain and when you the drop away was weakly positive echo was normal but what happens when you touch this patient this patient was having severe tenderness so why should Like you can see, you should have a severe tenderness. Just if you mildly palpate the chest, even if you do for nascalation, if you slightly press, the patient was wincing with pain. So, what was the diagnosis? This definitely no acute coronary syndrome patient will wince with pain when you are going to palpate or when you are going to just. So, this nothing but this is a patient of multiple myeloma with lot of osteoporotic lesions. So, again, these patients due to some calcium disturbances can present with non-specific ST segment changes, and they will have chest pain. And drop a was elevated in this patient due to renal involvement. So, this patient. so you can see the classical soap bubble appearance here and it's nothing but this is this is again i can say multiple myeloma presenting as a uh, yeah, yeah yeah acs mimic right this is another patient with a past history of open heart surgery ecg is showing left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern there is st segment depression in lateral leads again he is having chest pain and the drop i was increased breathlessness was there 0.7 so what is the importance see you can see uh, this is the Uh, X-ray is showing a mediastinal superior mediastinal widening is there, and you can see there is a stent graft is there, right? So what happened? This patient was actually he had uh, underwent uh, ascending aorta, uh, ascending aorta to uh, distal thora, DTA, distal thoracic aorta graft repair, but he started leaking from distally. So there is a recurrence of the aortic aneurysm and uh, this was an impending rupture so in such patient if you are going to heparin or if you are going to give antiplatelets rupture is going to be more facilitated and you are going to do more harm than good uh, so you have to be very very uh, careful so you have to take into consideration everything this is a young male non smoker syncope history of recurrent syncope but no chest pain but if you see the ecg v1 to v3 there is going to be st segment elevation like is very classical coving st segment elevation is nothing but a brugada syndrome please all of you go and read about brugada syndrome because it itself is an a topic separate topic so what i am trying to say brugada syndrome can present as andrew all mimic so it will be very very careful so okay we are done with that just few slides two or three slides left this is a 65 old male with acute renal failure mild chest pain chest pain increases with respiration ecg was up So what is the diagnosis? So we all know that there is going to be ST segment. There is the ECG shows ST segment elevation and V1 to V3. Also, if you see AVR, AVR is also the orphan lead is also showing the ST segment elevation. But if you see the T waves are not good. The T waves are very tall, peaked T waves, right? And patients are having mild chest pain. Why should the chest pain in patients with acute coronary syndrome should increase with respiration? This is a kind of pleuritic chest pain. and is a case of acute renal failure so hyperkalemia should be suspected hyperkalemia can present with st segment depression can present as st segment elevation right so it can be an anterior volume mimic so very important all the electrolytes in this patient showed a potassium of 7.5 okay it's very important so you have to aggressively correct this is another patient so what is shown here so this patient elderly patient admitted for sepsis with mps so ecg is like this So what is very peculiar is a white QRS rhythm going on. We can't see the P wave, so only QRS, and there is no ST segment also. So the ST segment is eaten off. There is merger of QRS and the T waves. So when you don't see ST segment, when you see a white QRS, you should always suspect a sine Q wave pattern. So this is a sine wave pattern, very classically seen in patients with hyperkalemia. So you should not diagnose this as a case of LBBV with acute coronary syndrome, right? So because this is this these are all the patients. Some of the patients have been treated as acute coronary syndrome with heparin, antiplatelets, and statins being given, which are not required in such patients. So this patient given good antiheparin measures, and you can very classically see when the antiheparin measures are given. The the sine wave pattern has gone. The white QRS is normalized, but the T waves are still taller. And with more correction of hyperkalemia, you can see the very classically the T waves are also normalized. So this is very very important. These are all the ECG changes in hyperkalemia which you can go and read. And again, this is a very common presentation. So patient present with acute gastroenteritis. So they will be called. So they will be again and again frustrating you, calling for a gastroenterology or calling for a cardiology opinion, saying that there is going to be acute coronary ischemia is there. Please come and do something. So you can see there is diffuse ST segment depression almost all leads and the QT interval is prolonged. 
and sometimes you can also see u waves also so when you think that you should always keep in mind of hypokalemia so very important hypokalemia can present with myriad of waves along with diffuse cyst segment depression u waves prolonged qt so just by treating hypokalemia the ecg changes settle down you don't need to take the patient for angiogram you don't need to treat the patient with uh, antiplatelets always right so what is this again another patient female patient abdominal pain irritability irritability and occasional palpitations so one thing what is very clear if you see the pvs are not very good right and the the st segment again i have told you the st segment is not there qrs followed by t wave and the qt interval is short so when you have a short qt interval and when you have no significant st segment uh, that uh, segment is not isolatory segment is not there hyperkalemia abdominal pain irritability then you have to suspect hypercalcemia very very important these are all the ec changes for hypercalcemia so uh, this is the last slide so lead avr is the uh, more of a neglected lead but gives valuable information so posterior leads has to be taken right side leads has to be taken in patients with acs it's 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 not only fun to localize the artery based on ecg but it's also life saving Leg disturbances are very important. They should be differentiated from acute coronary syndrome because hypokalemia is not it can be life-threatening, right?